The PINWAF, also known as the Pacific Northwest Opportunities Fund, is a grant provided by the Pacific Northwest District of Key Club International to assist with funding a Key Club's unique service project that either benefits our district project, Help End Hunger, or the applicant's local community at large. All dues paid clubs are eligible to apply for this grant. The grant amount ranges from $100 to $1,000 and can cover up to two thirds of the anticipated cost of the project. The PINWAF application opened on September 1st, 2022, and it will close on October 31st, 2022. All grant applicants will be notified in mid-November whether their submission has been approved or denied. The 2022 to 2023 winners will be officially announced to our district at DECON 2023. If your club would like to hold a high impact service project but is lacking in funds, this is a great opportunity to aid in carrying out your project. It's not too late to get in touch with your club's officer board and advisors to begin planning out the service project you would like to create and starting the application process. Remember to submit your applications before October 31st, 2022. Now I'll pass it off to Lieutenant Governor of Division 54, Grace, for a recap of last year's winning PINWAF recipients. Thank you, Chloe. So here are some examples of different successful PINWAF projects from last year. Ashland High School Key Club provided support for students and families that were displaced by wildfires in Southern Oregon in 2022, um, in 2020. And using the PINWAF grant, they purchased important items recommended by the school district, such as portable heaters, grills, and laundry baskets, which were delivered to 53 families. Clackamas High School supported their local families with an annual community event, the Winter Blitz. Using the PINWA fund, they were able to purchase necessities to provide families in their community with various essentials during the holiday season. Hazen High School Key Club was able to create over 40 handmade tie blankets using fabrics and supplies purchased with PINWA funds to donate to a local homeless shelter for women, children, and families. Ingram High School's clothing drive provided over 20 low-income students at their local elementary school with unique wardrobe packs to use throughout the school year. Ingram Key Clubbers used the PINWAF funds to purchase different clothing items, such as socks, shirts, coats, and more. Interlake High School's AAPI Elderly Kits was a project where they were able to create and donate 60 safety kits for their community to protect the AAPI community against hate crimes. Interlake used the funds received from the PINWAF to purchase personal alarms, keychains, lanyards, and more. So now let's hear from our panelists who will introduce themselves with their name, role, division, and school to talk about their 2021 to 2022 successfully completed projects. Jeannie, I think you're muted. Jeannie, Jeannie, you're muted. Turn on your... Okay. okay, is that better? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jeannie Welcher. I am a area administrator for Division 82 in Southern Oregon and Northern California. And I am a Kiwanis advisor to the Ashland High School. And our project uh, was basically to provide needed things for the uh, fire victims uh, of the 2020 huge fire that encuffled all the Southern Oregon schools. So that was kind of, we did it in two years. We went for the first year in 2020 and then for the second year in 2021. And we, of course, purchased different things for the different time factors. And uh, it turned out to be an extremely successful project for the key clubbers. They just loved every minute of that project. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Debbie Miller, and I am, uh, well, former key club advisor and on faculty at Clackamas High School. I'm still uh, and involved in uh, the club and in our service project, uh, the one that received the, the grant has received the grant for several years now called Winter Blitz. Winter Blitz has been a, 
a project that has grown with our school and into our entire school district since 1997. Uh, where, we're, where we are, where we were last year is uh, we serve 440 families uh, with almost 1,200 uh, students across the district. That included uh, nine Title I schools, uh, parent, uh, teen parent programs, and uh, and uh, some homeless community work in our district. We uh, provide it's a it's a winter blitz is a winter blitz is a uh, uh, winter season uh, project where we provide um, uh, um, household items, presents or, or gifts for students. Um, uh, there's food, food baskets uh, in conjunction with the Lions and Elks Club clubs, and also uh, we um, provide house uh, um, personal care items and toiletries, which we can thank um, the 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 grant for the past few years in helping us uh, provide to those 440 families. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Juan Nguyen. Uh, I went to Hazen High School last year, um, and I was the immediate past president there. Uh, right now, I am a freshman at UW Seattle studying computer engineering, so that's super fun. Um, my school's um, service project was the tie blanket project. Basically, we bought a lot of fabric with the grant um, and then had uh, we made kits and then we kind of gave out the kits to our school. They made them, they brought them back, and then we were able to donate them to a nonprofit organization in the greater Seattle area. And then they were able to give them out to families, uh, women, children um, who needed it for the winter. So that was super fun. Hello, uh, I'm Sarah Desai. I'm the immediate past president of Interlake Key Club in Division 28. Um, and I'm currently also a freshman at UW Seattle studying anthropology pre-law. Um, so a little bit more about my school's project. Our project was providing safety kits to AAPI elders in the larger Seattle area during the height of the COVID pandemic, where we saw the most hate crimes targeted towards AAPI elders. In total, we made around 60 safety kits that were comprised of mini alarms, hotline number cards, and flashlights, and things like that, just to bring more security in a time of stress and a lot of turmoil. Thank you for your introductions, panelists. Now we will begin with our moderated question and answer period. The first question we have for our panelists is, what was the most fulfilling aspect about applying for and receiving the PINWAF grant? So I basically, I'm Jeannie Welcher again from Ashland High School. And the most fulfilling part was really just seeing all the things that were purchased through Pinwaf and bringing them to the school district. And they brought families in there to receive the products that we purchased. The first year we did uh, bought 25 space heaters because these people were homeless and people would donate their trailers that year, but it didn't really have anything in it, didn't even have a heater. So they asked us to purchase the space heaters and they were so appreciative because it was like December when we received the, the money and received the actual space heaters. Uh, we were also able the second year, we, these people were now in purchased trailers from the school district that got a huge grant. So 53 families received these beautiful trailers uh, in talent. And of course they needed a lot of different things. Uh, the most important thing was the laundry baskets and the laundry soap and the conditioner and things of this sort. It sounds pretty um, low key, but you, would, you just couldn't believe the expression on their faces. They had very little money and to have something to clean their clothes and uh, be comfortable. That was a huge thing. And the, the uh, we had about 10 key clubbers go each year to see the families. We couldn't go into their homes, 
but we could meet them at the school district office and give them these products. So that was the most fulfilling part of it. Uh, Debbie, I think you're muted. There, I think I think that's it. Um, I I'm not used to Zoom, Google Meet. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> So uh, I think we had a similar experience to Jeannie. Uh, it, the mo it is incredibly gratifying when the families that we are we are serving that uh, that we are providing supplies and gifts for uh, come to pick up those items, which happens uh, for us uh, in December. Uh, our event has grown from, I think we had maybe uh, three families in 1997 to the 440. They come now, not just to Clackamas High School, but also to uh, the other high schools in our district. Um, uh, so uh, we've spread the love around and, uh, and to see those families come on the day of and have our key club volunteers, hand them, give them the gifts, help them with the pop-up store shopping, uh, provide the food baskets uh, and uh, donate donated clothing items and uh, household items is incredible. But I would say even more filling for us has been the experience of having the grant uh, and knowing that we're supported by the district, knowing that we are not just doing this in our district with our uh, partnerships with community churches and businesses and with other clubs at Clackamas High School and the other high schools like Leadership and National Honor Society, everyone participates in this effort, but it's knowing that our district is behind us and supporting us and helping us make this possible. So it, it, it really is significant to us that Key Club is, um, that the Pacific Northwest is supporting us and that all of Key Club is behind us. I totally agree with you, Debbie. Um, just to start off, um, it's so great that you can, Key Club has this opportunity where you can even apply for such an amazing grant, um, being able to receive so many um, so much support is really nice when you have all of these great big grand ideas that most of the time can't be automatic like 100% funded but with this grant it was really helpful um obviously there are so many aspects that made it feel so fulfilling but um kind of to add a new aspect is the amount of volunteers that could help. So for our project, it was very DIY, right? So you get the package, you do it yourself, and then you return it back to the school. Um, if we didn't have this grant, we would be able to make maybe 10, 15 blankets at max, but with so much demand and so much want to be able to do your service and to help your community, it was really nice to see so many people um, have that want to help, have that want to serve their community. And it was nice being able to um, kind of provide enough materials and enough um, service projects where it could be fulfilled for not only our club, but maybe other people around the school who aren't in Keep a Club who also want to participate in our service projects as well. Juan, I completely agree with you. I think a lot of the times with these like high school funded projects, directed projects, I think feasibility is a really big issue and that usually comes down to funding and money, which is something that is definitely hard to access when you are in high school, um, especially when it comes to things like dealing with the school to be able to access your club funds and stuff like that, because there's usually a lot of restrictions. Um, for example, at our school specifically, we're not allowed to use our club funds unless we are doing a fundraiser. So a lot of these events that involve like donation drives and things are completely infeasible without the aid of things like the PINWA. Um, I would also like to add that just being able to directly hand out these kits to community members and seeing the impact it made on them and being able to provide uh, them with some semblance of security in a time of like 
such emotional and political stress and strife during the pandemic was just something really rewarding that is definitely like an experience that I will definitely remember um, as part of my time in Key Club. And I think it's really great that the Pinwaf allows for such experiences to take place. Thank you for those eloquent responses. Uh, moving on to the second question, how did receiving the Pinwaf grant benefit your club or community? Well, as I mentioned, you know, we the Southern Oregon wildfire in 2020 uh, took about 3,000 students out of the Phoenix Talent School District. And the school district, of course, was overwhelmed because they expect, you know, they do get money for each student. So now they have a very limited budget for the school because of the number of, of uh, students that were affected by it. So it was really important um, that we actually direct our efforts uh, to the actual individuals. Uh, we had about 78 students that attended Ashland High School. The distance from Ashland High School to Phoenix High School is about three miles. So it's very close. They're very close high schools. We have about 78, or we did have 78 students that lived in talent that did go to Ashland High School and had their homes destroyed. So it was a very personal thing for a lot of the key clubbers. They knew um, quite a few people that were homeless. And it was just hard to imagine how they could be normal, everyday people, and then have nothing in their uh, kitchen, nothing in their bedroom, no clothing, no blankets. So it was so rewarding to actually be able to take uh, the money from Pinwaf for two years and give it to the families that were so desperately in need of these particular items. And I, I think I would say the same thing for us. Um, we took the thousand dollar grant that we received in the past two years and it all went to Amazon. We bought toiletries <laughs> and personal items for Amazon. So uh, to, to know that that money, 100% of that money went to buy toothpaste, toothbrushes, shampoo, deodorant, conditioner, bath soap, uh, all the items that we sort of take for granted that our folks have to make decisions every month, whether they're going to feed their families or buy these cleaning products or, you know, to, and especially during the holiday season when they want to try to find a way to buy gifts for their children. So, so it, that it's powerful. It's, it's a direct contribution it's a huge process to put these toiletries together and hand out 440 gift bags. And that came directly from this grant this past two years. So for us, um, it was just really nice to see that our efforts made an impact to our community so locally. And I believe um, all four of the panelists will probably feel the same way. Where you're living, you experience these things, whether it, it's you yourself or you kind of see other people going through it. It's nice to see that, <laughs> hey, I was able to touch this family or this person with the service that I had. Um, homelessness is really big in Seattle and Mary's Place, the nonprofit that we donated to is also pretty popular. So a lot of the students already had heard about it and they already know what good the nonprofit did. Um, so it was really nice being able to help our community, even though we didn't know who the blankets directly went to, it was a good feeling knowing that what you did will help your community, not just this year, but maybe in future years to come as well. Um, for us specifically, our school, like I talked about before a bit, we are not allowed to use any of our club funds unless we're using them to specifically do a fundraiser. So the PINWAP really allowed us to pursue all of our non-fundraiser related projects that we were passionate about and really tackle an issue that we saw was really pervasive in our community, but we had no way to address. So the PINWAP really made it feasible for us to bring about this change um, in our community, which we really appreciated. 
Okay, and moving on to the third question, what were some ob obstacles you faced when planning the project and how did you overcome them? Well, for the uh, Southern Oregon wildfire, uh, it was so important to figure out who we should talk to and find out what does the school district want. And we narrowed it down to the superintendent of Phoenix Talent School District and the person that was the board chair of the uh, school. And those two people were instrumental in helping us define what exactly we needed to get. And that was kind of a huge obstacle to overcome was just actually doing the right thing, went to the right people, got the information, and we were able to go forward. Uh, we had um, about, I'm just trying to think, $1,000 for each year. And we had to do, of course, uh, another fundraiser because they only give you two thirds of what you ask for. So the logical thing for us was a car wash. Uh, we can make fairly quick money with a car wash at Les Schwab in Ashland. And it just took about four hours to make $500 uh, for two different car washes, which helped us pay the difference than, uh, from what the, the actual things that we purchased to what Pinwaf gave us. Okay, uh, well, there, there are multiple obstacles and challenges every year for us. I'm not sure I can focus directly on one, but um, our, our goal every year is that we do not turn away families. So no matter who comes to us, we find a way to help them. And that can be anything from uh, gifts, uh, gift cards for the kids, to food baskets, to uh, appliances. Um, we've had families that were homeless that we helped with electric frying pans and microwaves they could set up in uh, in their hotel or in their motels and temporary housing. Uh, clothing, of course, is a big thing uh, as well. Winter clothing uh, and and vacuums. It depends on what what we need. So uh, sourcing those things, paying for those things. Uh, we, the toiletries, of course, and personal items we take care of, uh, thanks to the grant, but uh, we also have to do a ton of fundraising. We fundraise all year long. Um, we, we write grants, we get grants, we form partnerships with businesses, we have credit unions that pay for t-shirts that we sell to help us, uh, but it's, it's an ongoing process. We're reaching out 12 months out of the year, um, asking for support and um, and and just and then doing all kinds of fundraising, which I know we're going to talk about later, uh, things that we do to raise funds. So, I think that's important. And then communication for us is huge, because we've gotten so big and we rely so much on volunteers across the entire district that we that we're in. Um, we we have community churches we partner with. We have these businesses. We have other schools. And so communicating between clubs, service clubs at different schools, we're the only key club in our district. So we, we really work with service clubs and leadership clubs at other schools. We just partner as best we can and we work together as a team and it all comes together somehow every year. But that's our that's that's probably our biggest challenges. Yeah, for us, it's we're all kind of in the same boat, but um, it's really a lot to plan. And I'm sure if you guys are on the board for any of your key clubs, you know how long it takes to plan a single meeting, right? So if you have service events that are one day or either one week, it takes a lot of time just to plan out all the little bitty itty details because there's always plan A, but you need plan B, plan C, et cetera. Um, but the fundraising, what they were kind of talking about, a big part of Pinwaf is that it only can cover two thirds of the project. So if you wanted to do a Pinwaf, uh, if you wanted to receive the grant, you would need to be able to fundraise that one third that's left. So what we did is we did a merch sale. Um, so we put our merch, we got the money back and we kind of 
gauged how much money we could ask from Pinwaf. So then it, it would cover the one third to the two third ratio. Um, but even then, that's not even part of the Pinwaf, but we had to start planning that way in advance so that we could get the Pinwaf when we got it. Yeah, so just it's kind of a, a full year event or way more than a week to plan, but at the end, it's all worth it. And if it's super successful this year, it's always nice to come back again and do it the following year. I know Debbie said her winter blitz is an annual thing. Um, at my school, we're trying to make this tie blanket service project also an annual thing. So writing those notes to your underclassmen or to your incoming board to say, hey, this is what we wish we did. Hey, this is what we should have done or we should have added is really helpful for them to uh, execute it again and make it even better than it was last year. Um, going back to what Debbie said, I think communication is definitely like one of the biggest obstacles for us specifically. It was more in the vein of delegating tasks and checking in. So most of the people um, on our board and on our project committee are like seniors or juniors. So we were all like very busy. Um, and we were supervising this project while also supervising our own like annual club project, which is our hygiene kids drive. Um, so it was a bit harder to like keep in check with everyone and have everyone's tasks organized and everything like that. Um, I think what we would have done differently probably next time is maybe like have set times to like check in with each other um so we don't get like bogged down and spend just like weeks on certain tasks and just more streamline the process so i would definitely say having set times to check in with different parts of the group and delegating tasks effectively is really essential to running a good project Okay, uh, thank you for all those responses. I will pass it on to L2G of Division 28, Maitran, to finish asking our moderated questions to our panelists. Thank you, Tolly. So our following question is, how were you able to promote and fundraise for the project? So for us, uh, of course, we had our key club that we were the only individuals in the school that was that were doing this project. Uh, we didn't couldn't rely on anybody else but our club. We had about 35 members uh, over the last two years. So it was a matter of really defining each person in the club what they were going to do to make this project happen. And we had a committee that would talk to the superintendent, talk to the board chair. Uh, then we had, you know, going through the actual purchase of these things you had to purchase it and you had to get the best bid so we had another committee for that so the committees were extremely important to pull this off uh, we didn't really have anyone else to rely on but but the key club itself so when you have that kind of pressure it's amazing how people come through for you so i was very pleased that um, for two years in a row the key club was able to focus and get the project done in a quick time Okay, um, I would just agree with everything everyone said. And also, Sarah, I, I really appreciated how you said the delegating and the scheduling, because I think that's critical for any project and so true for us as well. I would say for us, for promotion, um, our situation is different because we know who we're giving to before we actually do the event. And it's not so much that we attract people that that are needy get the word out for them as uh, we get applications that people have completed through their school counselors at all of the elementary middle school and high schools in the district and so by that process of them applying we we find out what they need and how we can address those needs and um and then to promote to promote what we're doing and of course the fundraising we uh, we use a lot of social media honestly that that's the most effective way in in this day and age i mean we we are po we are checking we're posting on our school and uh, district-wide uh, websites 
and on all the social media accounts. We use uh, community social media posts on Facebook and Instagram and Nextdoor to get the word out about what we're doing and asking for funds. We've been fortunate over the years because we've been around so long that we have local news media coverage, not every year, but most every year we have somebody come out and film uh, protecting people's, you know, confidentially protecting their anonymity. But they come and they film the day of the event. They see us with the kids carnival and the pop-up stores and the, the gifts uh, being uh, given to the families. And um, that media, that video on the news is very powerful for us for fundraising. So we're lucky to have that. Um, we also have business and community partners like credit unions and, and uh, Fred Meyer and some of the other um, uh, businesses here that, that help us with sponsorships, uh, signage in their stores, promotion, uh, and that's invaluable to us as, all, as well. For fundraising, we, we do everything we can think of. We write, as I said, tons of grants. And um, what we find as we write grants is that we, are, it, when we are finally able to convince, fo convince folks to give us a grant, it's a lot easier to get it the following year. Once you get a grant relationship with, with a company or business, then it's much easier to get that renewed every year. And so that, that you can't count on it, but it, you don't have to jump through as many hoops. Once you get Walmart to give you some money, it's much easier the next year. So, so we, find, we find that that has helped us. We also do everything working races, like we are working a corner at the Portland Marathon uh, on Saturday and they are paying us for that. And that money will go straight to Winter Blitz. We do car washes, we sell these candies um, to the community. We, uh, we ask our churches and the community, uh, other community nonprofits to support us and they are generous and, and we go to nonprofits as well. So we, and we sell lots of t-shirts. So we're always looking to expand our fundraising, but um, it, it takes some coordination and, um, and, and it's time consuming, but it but it it does pay off because it's visibility for for our winter blitz. Alrighty. So as far as promotions for our service project, the only thing we really had to promote is um, kind of just saying, hey, do you want to participate in? this service project, just because after we made the tie blankets, we just gave it to the nonprofit and then they handled the rest. So if you want an easy um, service project, that's always a good way to go. If you want to find um, a nonprofit that helps with local homelessness and other issues like that. Um, but for us, just to list it off, we shared on our Instagram, we have a school TikTok, um, obviously um, kind of announcements that go off every day. We ask them to promote with that. Um, we have an email thread for a key club and also a remind text service app. Um, so that was really easy. We have our key club meetings every Monday. So every Monday we promoted our um, tie blankets there. Um, but also like at your school, you can make posters, post them up. Hey, we have a tie blanket thing going on. Come join us or really just setting up a booth during lunch. That's always the easiest. Um, people come and go all the time around the commons. So, um, seeing a physical presence of people there really helps sometimes instead of just seeing a poster on the wall. Um, for our club specifically, a lot of our officers and project committee were affiliated with churches or community centers in the AAPI community. So we already had that like pre-established connection to promote the project through. Um, for fundraising specifically, we contacted our Bellevue Qantas Club, um, which is just like an indispensable resource. And I would highly recommend you guys to reach out to them because they're, to, they're there to help and they're kind of like the parent organization of Key Club. So usually they're really helpful. And we asked them if they'd be willing to make this kind of like a joint project and pledge a certain amount of money um, 
to this project since a majority of it would already be covered by the PINWAF anyways. And then they also promoted it through like their own social media and um, different like types of multimedia avenues and resources and personnel. And that really helped us getting the word out there um, and also just allowed us to have that like connection between another organization that was kind of doing the same thing as thing as us. All right, thank you panelists for your answers. Our last and final question is, what advice can you give for someone going through the planning slash application process? For our particular project, the wildfire, of course, um, the first month, everybody in Ashland uh, was helping out. They would bring clothing. They would make sure the restaurants were open for food for these people. Uh, people gave their their bedrooms to these people. They were totally homeless, and there was a you know just a great effort by the whole Southern Oregon community. But then after a couple months go by, all of a sudden you know a lot of things uh, you need to continue with, and that's where our key club, uh, of course, approached our Kiwanis Club. Um, who gave us advice about uh, who to talk to. And so we did, of course, reach out to the superintendent and uh, the board super, the board uh, president uh, to get the information we needed. Uh, it was invaluable uh, for us to have that month of December, which was when we received the space heaters. These people were very uh, in need of something to warm their, their actual uh, Tra tractors up there were every family had at least two children in those trailers so it was important that you have the important little things whether it's a laundry basket uh, soap for their dishwashers or for their uh, wash machines and dryers just every little thing you could think of we were able to pull together for these families and so I, I really like the fact that we were a little delayed. You know, the fire was in September and we started producing our effects of our fund drive uh, for Christmas. So that was just a really joy to have the Christmas uh, things that we needed both in both years. We have that. I love the, the deadline was October 31st. And by the time you got the money, everything was perfect for Christmas. I, I agree with Jeannie, the timing is perfect for us as well. So, I mean, I I would say that reaching out to the community, as, as Sarah and Dwan mentioned, uh, we had support from Kiwanis. We, uh, we had some changes with our club sponsorship uh, um, with Kiwanis and that required some adjustments for us, but we had tremendous support from uh, from the uh, our division and our district. And also uh, we reached out to Rotary Club, Lions and Elks. Uh, there were other community groups that were doing the same kinds of things we were doing like with food drives, uh, canned food drives and fundraising. And, uh, and, we, and we combined forces and that absolutely made us more more effective and more powerful. I would say planning is really critical, thoroughly and completely preparing all the information about your project so you can speak to people about it and represent it well uh, within your school community, or in our case, school community and outside outside that community into the, in, into the whole district. Um, also, and trying to anticipate and address questions in advance. And, and we have, because we've done this project for so long, we always debrief, we always review what happened. We try to be as flexible as can, we can be, especially when we're as big as we are. And we are, not, we are not afraid to say that didn't work. We made mistakes, we have to fix it. We'll do it differently next year. And, and when you have officers that are juniors and seniors, sometimes it's difficult to get that message across. But the advisors and and bringing in the younger uh, members, the freshmen and sophomores from the beginning really helps with that transition and keeping the continuity. So I'd also just share, uh, take as many photos, videos and social media posts as you can and share them everywhere and share them over and over again to get the message out. 
know and describe what your expected goals or outcomes are. What, what, what do you want to accomplish? Focus on who benefits and how, and explain why the project is important to your club. I mean, I, I, you know, just being able to explain it to each other and to other people like now where I'm stumbling around, that's, that's what helps us stay focused every year and make it happen, so. My biggest piece of advice is don't be afraid to kind of dream big. Um, with this grant, it really gives you such a broader opportunity. I know from like week to week, our service opportunities are just, oh, help pick up trash or help um, clean up the park or something like that. But with this, we were able to really bring an idea that we had come to life, right? We didn't think we would be able to do this, but we were able to. And maybe in years to the future, it'll turn into something bigger and grander like Debbie's Winter Blitz, right? A whole big, wide, almost city event, which is awesome. Um, but if you haven't opened up the Pinwaff application yet and you are interested in doing the Pinwaff, I would highly encourage you just to open it to see all of the questions. Um, I feel like going through the questions, it really helps you get prepared for your service project if you haven't already started planning already. Uh, there's certain questions on the Pinwaff saying like, oh, give your, I think, estimated dates or your estimated um, schedule for when you want to accomplish certain parts of your service project. So that already helps you just by applying to kind of get yourself situated, get your club situated and already start that planning process. And I feel like as you complete that pinwalf application, you'll be answering questions that will really make you want to do the service project even more. Questions like, who will this help? Like, why will this help, et cetera? I'm kind of going off the top of my head, but really opening up that Pinwaff application will really inspire you and push you to <laughs> do the service projects that you didn't think you were going to be able to do. Um, one more thing, um, when I was on the board, um, we applied for the project twice. So year one and year two, let's say. We didn't get it the first year. Um, but what we did is we reapplied, um, kind of made our ideas a little bit better, a little bit more concise, and then we got it the following year. So don't be discouraged if, let's say, uh, oh, your upperclassman said, oh, I applied for the pinwaff. We didn't get it. Don't apply this year. There's no point. There is a point. You might get it. Um, and it's always worth a shot to take a grab at this opportunity that the PNW is giving you. Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think the Pinwaff application is really going to make you think more deeply about the project and not only like what you and your club can gain from the project, but also exactly how you can benefit your community and how you are going to go about uh, your project. Um, for specific advice, I think definitely set up a designated time every week to check in and do updates on tasks. Um, I think like the president of the club or just like leader of the project in general, like you should have like one or two people that are leading this project should and they should individually check in with the people they've assigned tasks to. Also, I think you should strike a balance between assigning tasks to officers that are seniors and more experienced, but perhaps are like a bit more busier with like college apps and classes and stuff. And then younger officers and members that have more time to dedicate to the project and want more opportunities to be in what to be involved and um, have the opportunity to like lead a project or lead a specific part of a project. Um, and I think striking that balance and delegating those tasks properly and effectively are just like essential parts of having a good, feasible, effective project. Um, thank you for all of your thoughtful responses, panelists. This concludes the moderated question and, question and answering portion of this webinar. I'll now pass it off to Legion to lead our open floor Q&A session. Um, 
anyways, thank you, May. Please use the Zoom chat or the raise your hand feature to ask any questions you might you may have for our panelists. You may ask direct questions to specific panelists if you choose, but please do not hesitate to ask any more questions. Um, okay, so we do have one person in the chat asking, well, what would you say to someone who is on the fence about applying to the PLOS? And feel free to any of the candidates who just answered this one. Um, sorry, were you going to say something? Okay. Um, uh, just as I said before, um, Pinwaf is really there for you to grab. Obviously, there's a saying you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? Um, although it is kind of a lengthy application, if you just think about it, it's free money, right? Might as well. Um, uh, obviously, there are some kind of short answer long answer parts but i feel like with the whole board it's really nice to do together um and again don't be scared to do it because it's really a resource that key club is so special for having right like if you see any other service organizations that are local they might not have this kind of grander PNW or even Key Club International backing to them. And that is a resource that we can use that we can apply to. Um, so yeah, I would just say open the application, look through the questions. Maybe if you're tired answering the questions one day, do it the next day or ask an officer to help in pitch in because honestly, it's not really that hard uh, once you see all the questions. What me and my board do, um, we make it a board meeting. So I share my screen as I'm typing. I ask for feedback. Oh, should I add this sentence? Should I um, take out the sentence? It's kind of a cool, fun board bonding as well. Um, yeah, I completely agree. Also, there's just no harm in applying. Um, even if you don't get it, for example, our club didn't get it the first year, but you do learn like how um, the applying process is structured, which I think is pretty helpful for the next time you're applying so you can apply what you learned the first time and apply it when you are reapplying for the grant. I also think that like Juan said, you can make it like make it like on a public board meeting or something. So it's just easier for everybody to give their input. And I would say also just like look around in your community and see what specific issues are affecting your community, especially more marginalized people in your community and what specific project you can do to help them out in a way that, um, in a way that is going to be like really personal and very effective to those specific people. One other thought is uh, uh, in the beginning of the school year, when you have your first meetings and you have an idea for the PINWAF, uh, by October 31st and you finish the application, you get the money very quickly. I mean, within two weeks, they've already told you yes or no. And it just gives you, you know, you don't have to wait six months to hear from a grant. They tell you immediately. So you can get excited. The club gets excited and, and things happen uh, for that reason. And I think it's a great opportunity to get the money from a PINWAF just because they are so expedient in all their work that they do. All right, thank you. And another question we have in chat is, if we do collaborate with another club, would we be able to split the funds with them or will, do we just have to keep it ourselves? I think that is a question that you can ask your advisor. Does, um, does, um, are we able to for this one? I'm a little confused because um, you're providing services or, or different things. I don't think there's any money left over, uh, assuming that the project is for two clubs are doing the same project to create more uh, help. So I don't really see where there's splitting the, the money. I don't quite get the question. Oh, all right. Um, moving on, 
um, our la- I think our last question is gonna be who can I ask? Who can I ask if my sponsoring Kiwanis Club is unresponsive or not active due to COVID? Um, I'm just gonna piggyback backwards. Sorry um, about that question. So how Penwolf works is that um, PNW kind of decides. I think on a num- on a, a sum of money they want to give out this year. Um, for the Pinwaf grant. And when you're applying as a club, you can pick how much money that you can apply for, whether that's $50, let's say, or $1,000. So if two clubs do want to kind of split the money, I guess they would do their own applications, but different sums of money for the application, if that makes sense. It's not a set, like it's not a set check. When you do your application, you kind of type out how much money you want in kind of consideration of how much money you need for your project. Um, And then to answer the upcoming question, if you don't have kind of a Kiwanis or even an advisor that's willing to reach out or willing to um, kind of help you on your project, there are so many other Kiwanians out there that can help you. Um, and they're always so nice and they're always so willing to reach out of hand. I know my advisor is the advisor of like two like divisions that are very, very far apart, but she's still willing to reach out because a lot of this help you can receive through messenger, through text, through email, through Zoom, right? Now that that is so established in our kind of internet world, it's really easy to ask for help, especially if you are close to another club or close to another LTG who maybe has a more um, present advisor, they can always help you kind of sort through things as well. Um, adding on to that, I think uh, if your Qantas uh, club advisors are not available, I definitely think you can reach out to other key clubs in your district and your area. Um, so you probably can't like do a joint application for the PINWAF, but I think you can do like a joint project in the way where you can like volunteer together and stuff to like assemble the project and do that um that's definitely something that we have like done before and it's pretty effective just because you have more of a supply of volunteers um to help run the project with but yes you will have to uh, apply as like one club entity if that makes sense um and yeah I, I just echo, I would just echo, sorry, I would just echo what Sarah said, because we're obviously one project, but we're all of our schools in our district. And so we apply for it, but like Adrian Nelson, who has a new club, is our new a new high school, they do the project with us. So we're, we're project focused and then we bring in the folks, uh, but it's all for one project, so. That's how we do it. And we, when we lost our amazing Kiwanis Club support, the Happy Valley Club, uh, thanks to COVID and everything else, uh, and we didn't know what we, were, we could do, we reached out to Brian and the, the folks at, uh, at uh, Pacific Northwest, and they helped us. They put us in contact with people in, in our club who were able to help us. So there's, there are resources everywhere. I agree with you. Other Kiwanians and, and our, own, our own people, if we need help, all we have to do is ask. Hi, thank you all for your wonderful responses. It looks like that's all we'll have time for today. Um, and this concludes, oh, if you, had any, if you had any more questions that we were unable to answer today, please feel free to email me at pinwap at pwkeyclub.org or treasure at pwkeyclub.org and I would love to help. Um, you can find the PINWAF application and any updates about our district on our Instagram, which is at pwkeyclub, our website and Facebook. So keep an eye out for that. And this concludes our September pinoff webinar. Thank you to everyone for joining us and a special thank you to all of our wonderful panelists for taking the time out of their busy day to speak with us tonight. Um, as a reminder, the pinoff application will be closing on October 31st at 11.59 p.m. So be sure to submit your applications before then.